After analyzing over 2 million in ad spend for ourselves and clients over the past few years, this is the best way to set up, manage, and of course, profit from Google Ads. So detailed timestamps below because this is a long one, along with a link to our Google Ads playbook to help you shortcut the process of keyword research and of course, writing your ads. Now, if you've already set up your ads account and you just need to jump straight into the campaign structure and all of that strategy and setup, here's the timestamp to do that. Otherwise, we'll just kick things off by heading over to ads.google.com. And even if you already have an account, you can just go ahead and click on start now, sign in with whatever email that you're going to use. You can change this. There's only one part of this process that's irrevocable. So we'll talk about that in a moment. So I'll just pretend like I've signed in. If you are currently in the process of setting up ads accounts or you have access to other ads accounts, they'll show up here. I've just blurred our client ones out. And I'll just go ahead and click to create a new ad account. And this is where it gets a little tricky because there's two different screens you might see. So we'll go through the more common one and then we'll go through the old version. So if you're not quite sure, you're looking at it going, this is not what I'm seeing. Don't worry, we'll show the other method in a moment. So what you want to do here is we need to get to the full version of Google Ads because Google is gonna try to be really helpful and hold your hand and we, we don't want that. We want full control right off the bat because we don't want to waste money. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and click on create a account without a campaign. And then this is the only part of the process you can't undo. So make sure you choose the correct currency. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and select no. I don't want to receive uh, Google's marketing. And then we can go ahead and click on submit, continue to your account. And once you reach a page that looks something like this, I swear Google's always changing how this looks, you're inside of your ads account and you have full access, you have full control. Now, just in case you didn't go through this process, I'm going to rewind in time really quickly and let's say you click this new ads account button and you get to a page that looks something more like this. Well, here you're going to want to look to switch to expert mode. That's essentially what Google is calling normal Google ads. They're just calling it expert mode now because they want you to go through this onboarding process that uh, will wind up costing you way more money than you need to spend. So we'll go ahead and click on switch to expert mode. And then when you get to a page that looks something like this, you could start creating your campaign, but you don't want to do that now. So we'll just click create, a can create an account without a campaign. We'll set the campaigns up later. So we'll go ahead and click on that. Again, we need to make sure that we select the correct currency. This cannot be undone. No, we don't want your marketing. And we'll go ahead and click on submit and explore your account. And just like that, you're also on the same page. So once we're here, we're ready to start creating your campaigns, but let's quickly go through a couple of settings that are going to be important before you create your first campaign. Again, timestamps below to skip around. So I'll come up here to tools and settings, and then I'll go over to billing and I'll click on settings. And this is going to be where you can actually enter your credit card information and Google's essentially going to bill you every time you owe them 50 bucks. And then eventually they'll change the billing cycle. It just depends upon how much money you spend with them and how long your account has been open. So the next key is coming up to tools and settings again, and then clicking on linked accounts. This is going to be where you can set up your Google Analytics 4 integration. And if any of these other integrations are important, like if you're doing anything with lead generation or lead forms, you're going to be able to use Zap Zapier or Zapier, I always say it the, the wrong way, to connect your lead forms to. But on the very first uh, round of setting up, just essentially make sure you connect it to your Google Analytics. It's going to be really important. And if you decide to run YouTube ads, you can connect it to your YouTube channel here. So we'll come back up to tools and settings. One more, access and security. This is going to be where you can change who has access to your account. So if you want other people like, let's say, our agency to help you out, shameless plug, then this is where you'd go to um, add us. And, or if you have someone else on your team, or if you just have a different email that you want to access your account with, you can add that email and then remove whatever emails you don't. So I'll just go back home. And that's all there is to it to getting set up, getting into Google, what Google now calls expert mode. And of course, making sure that you know where the basic settings are for access and billing, and of course, connecting Google Analytics 4. And once you've done those things, you're ready to set up your first campaign. Now, when it comes to setting up your first campaign, all you need to do is go and click on this new campaign button here, and then you'll get to a page that looks something like this, where Google is going to try and hold your hand, just like they probably did when you were setting up your account. 
And this is where we're going to have to again say, thank you, but uh, you're going to cause more harm than good this round. So we're just going to go it alone. And you'll go ahead and click on create a campaign without goals or guidance. This gives you all of the options you need. And especially when you're just getting started, some of these other things like leads and sales, they aren't even going to work properly because you have to set up a bunch of tracking codes on your site for those to work. Uh, with Tag Manager, I'll leave a link in the cards in the description to that video because that's what you'll do next. But for now, we'll click without goals or guidance, and then we'll go ahead and select search. So this is going to be make sure that our ads are showing up just in search. We'll have to tell Google again, but for now, this is good enough. And we'll go ahead and click on continue. Now it's going to ask you for some business information. You don't need to enter this at all. This is just going to be Google's way of trying to find keywords and spoiler alert, the keywords are going to most likely be really irrelevant, if not just downright terrible. So you can skip that. So we'll just come down to the campaign name, go ahead and enter in whatever makes sense to you. You'll develop your own naming convention. For the most part, you just wanna be able to look at the campaign and know what type of campaign it is and what the goal is. And that's all you need to do. So we'll go and click on continue. And now we're finally inside of our campaign and we can start setting up the settings. And a great way to say that, set up the settings. <laughs> so let's quickly jump into this diagram and walk through the structure of the ads account so you know how these settings are going to apply to everything that you're doing. If you want to skip the little strategy section, just jump straight back into the interface. Here's the timestamp to do that. So what we're doing right now is setting up your campaign settings at the very top here. So this is going to be your location, your bidding, your budget, your ad schedule, start and stop dates. And it's going to apply to all of your ad groups, which is below. So in our ad groups, this is where we make tiny clusters of keywords and where we tell Google who we want our ads to be shown to. And then inside of those ad groups, we're going to write our ads, which is what people physically see when they type in our keywords into Google and of course our ads hopefully show up. And so that's just a quick rundown of how the campaigns are structured. We have our campaign, our ad groups, and then of course our ads. So let's jump back over into the interface here and we'll start with bidding. So with bidding, there are some really cool things you could do with this. We could make a whole video on it. But for now, before you have conversion tracking and purchase tracking and all that fun stuff you can get to later, you're just going to want to bid per click. So we'll just leave it at clicks here. And then we're going to want to set a maximum cost per click. And this is going to essentially be how much are we willing to pay when someone clicks on our ad? Now you may be wondering, okay, but how should I know how much to actually pay? Well, the good news is WordStream has done that research for us. So here are some basic industry averages of how much you could expect to pay per click based upon your type of business. And so what I recommend is just go through this list, find the niche or industry that is most closely related to what you are, and then just add five or six cents to it, right? Because Google is a auction based system. So we don't want to bid the average. We want to bid just above. It's kind of like the old eBay days where you're bidding one cent at a time, right? <laughs> Trying to just inch out the uh, previous person. And so here, what I'll do, since we're going to be doing this for business services, I'm just going to put the bid at 386 since the average was 380. And that's as complicated as the bid has to be because after just a couple days, you're going to start to see how much things actually cost. And in fact, Google will actually tell you, but they're not gonna tell you here. They're, they're only gonna tell you after you start to spend money. So we can go and click on next. And I just wanna say, you don't need a fancy software to figure out what your bidding should be at the beginning. Just use those averages. Google will tell you exactly how much it costs to be at the top of the page or just on the first page. So we'll go ahead and click on next here. And then we have another area where we have to say, hey, hey, Google, please do what we asked and then not keep expanding what uh, you're trying to give us. So the first thing we need to do is uncheck search partners. So this is an example of what search partners can look like. As you can see, this is a random site. Someone types in some keywords and then our ads could show up on this random site. We don't want that. We only want to show up when someone goes to google.com and makes a search on Google itself whether desktop or mobile. And then we need to come down here and click uncheck display network. And this essentially makes sure that when we are running our ads, they literally only show up on google.com. You don't want them showing up on random websites. So next we have locations. And so there's a little tricky thing in here, unless you are a hotel or in real estate. 
So the first thing you actually wanna do is come down to location options here, and we are going to select presence. And so the issue here is you'll see presence or interest was by default. And this means that this your ads will target people not only in your target locations, but who are interested in your target locations. And for most of us, we don't really care about people who are interested in our target location. We want people who are physically in it, right? Especially if we have a, a physical store or we're working with shipping, right? So if someone comes to our site and they're interested in, let's say, Oklahoma, but they don't actually live there and they're in, you know, Canada or something, we don't ship to Canada. Well, Google might show our ad to, to someone who was looking up vacations in Oklahoma. I know that's a really random example, but that's how it works. So we'll go and make sure we click on presence. Spent way too much time on that. So next, what we want to do is come over here to enter another location. So we'll go ahead and click on advanced search, and then I'll bring up this little diagram here. So depending upon your type of business, this will dictate how you go about adding locations. So if you are e-commerce or you're 100% online, you're shipping you know, worldwide or countrywide, then you're just going to have one country per campaign like we're about to do here. So if you're servicing just one, let's say state, territory, or province, then go ahead and use counties or big cities as your targeting. If you're local and let's say you have a 30 to 50 mile radius around whatever your business is, then you're going to want to use zip codes, neighborhoods, and radius targeting. You can't use zip codes by themselves and you can't use, or you shouldn't use zip codes by themselves and you shouldn't use radius targeting by themselves. I have a whole rant on that, but suffice it to say, you can use radius targeting around whatever your particular business is, but then also include zip codes or neighborhoods so that you have data to start to understand where exactly your customers are coming from. It's gonna be really helpful when you start optimizing your campaigns. So rant is over. We'll go ahead and click on add locations in bulk. I'm going to shortcut the process. I'm gonna jump over to our campaign builder here, linked up in the description. If you want to learn more, it is a paid tool. And I'll go ahead and copy all our, our 50 states, drop them in there. I'll go ahead and click on search here, click on target all. And you'll see that in our map over here, I've moved it so you can see, now all 50 states are being targeted and we don't have any overlaps. So unless you're a local business doing radius targeting plus something else, you don't want any overlaps in what you're targeting because you want to be able to see the specifics of which locations are performing the best for you. So we'll go ahead and click on save here and then we can go ahead and come down to languages. Now, for the most part, you're gonna be able to leave this alone because you're gonna be entering keywords. So presumably your keywords are in the language that you're looking to target. But if for some reason that isn't the case, then you can go ahead and set up your languages here. Now, the next option you have is audience targeting. Please ignore this. This is great for YouTube and search and discovery ads, not so much when it comes to Google search. So we'll come down here to more settings and we'll click on ad rotation. And I'm gonna go through another little rant here. So by default, it's on optimize, prefer best performing ads. And for most of us, that's probably okay because we're not gonna be checking this as much as we want to because we have so many other things to do, right? But let's just go through an example so you know what you're missing out on when you let Google just kind of take the wheel. So let's say we have two ads, right? And then we want to see which one performs better, obviously. And if we have it on rotate evenly, 300 impressions on one, 300 impressions on another, then we come in and see one got a 10 clicks, another got two clicks. Well, it's pretty obvious which ad's doing better. So you turn off the one that didn't get as many clicks and you keep running the one that got more clicks. And then you try again, right? You try and say, okay, how do we improve this ad? How do we get more clicks out of those 300 impressions? Well, the problem with Google Optimize, optimizing is you'll come in a week later and you'll find that one got 500 and the other only got 100. And you're like, well, you can't compare apples to apples because one got so much more than the other, how do you know which one's better? The answer is you don't. Uh, Google just made a decision and decided that one was the one that should get all the traffic and it makes it really hard to improve your ads. Now, after saying all that, for most of us, we simply don't have time to go in and continually update ad copy. And so unless you have someone doing it for you or you're really, really committed to this, then you can probably just leave it at optimize. But it is important to know what you're kind of missing out on. So I'll go ahead and leave it on optimize and we'll jump down to our start and end dates. So here, 
What I like to do is I like to start my campaigns on a Thursday. That just happens to be because I like to review stuff on Friday and, and, and Saturdays. And so that way the campaigns are always kind of ending. So you do want to think about when am I going to check this, right? Because if you're going to check it Monday morning, then you probably want to have your start date on a Sunday so that you are always looking back a whole week's worth of data. For me, it's Friday or Saturday. So I want stuff to end on Thursday. It's weird, but that's just the way my schedule seems to work out. So I'll have it start um, in the future, although you realize that it takes a long time to make and edit these videos. So the date is actually already in the past, but we'll go ahead and say that I'm gonna run it for two weeks. And I highly recommend you do this. Please set an end date because Google will not give you your money back if you forget to turn off your ads, if you forget to turn off your campaign. It's way better to come back in a month and go, oh shoot, I totally forgot versus, oh, I totally forgot and they spent a lot of money. I'm not gonna get that back, right? Please don't fight Google on the credit card because then they're just gonna suspend and ban your entire account, right? So go ahead, we'll set an end date. One more thing under more settings here, ad schedule. If you need your ads to be running when your business is physically open or when you're actually going to be taking phone calls, then you can go ahead and get pretty detailed with what times of day you want people to see your ad. Now, in the past, I would actually recommend breaking this out and have like four hour blocks. But after analyzing over 2 million in ad spend in multiple different businesses and niches, not as big of a deal <laughs> as we initially thought. So uh, you can go ahead and leave this alone. There's so many other factors that are going to be so much more important when it comes to optimizing your ads versus trying to obsess over which hour of the day you seem to be getting the most leads or traffic. So with that, we are all done with the basic campaign settings. So I'll go ahead and click on next here. And we are now ready to start setting up our keywords. So if we hopped back over to our diagram, at the very top, we've just set up the campaign settings with the exception of the budget because Google's a little weird right now. And now we're ready to start looking at our ad groups and specifically what keywords to use. And the good news is we only need maximum of let's say 30 keywords to get started. So when we're creating ad groups, we're going to group keywords in very closely related clumps. So three to seven max. And when we get into match types, you'll see how that winds up being a lot more. But in terms of unique keywords, we're going to have three to five ad groups and three to seven keywords per ad group, right? That's all we need to do here. So to save you a ton of time when it comes to research, here are some examples of some different types of keyword kind of formulas you can use. And as you can see, they're all very descriptive. You can always pause if you want to read more or check out the link in the description to the playbook that has all of these formulas outlined for you. And it really is this simple, right? We're just looking at how do we describe what we offer in plain whatever language it is, because people aren't fancy when they're typing in what they're looking for, right? So we just need to be descriptive of whatever it is we have to offer. So let's say for our example, we're a Facebook ads agency and we're looking to get more clients. Well, here's what some of our ad groups would look like. And so as you can see here, they're very similar, right? We're just changing a couple words here and there. But the reason that we want to group these together this way is we're going to be able to be very specific with our ad copy, right? Because when someone types in ads management versus agency versus manager, we want that to be reflected in the headline because we want to be able to enter that conversation in the back of your customer's mind. So of course you can check out the link in the description to the playbook, or you can come up with your own keywords. However you decide to do it, let's jump back into the interface here. And I'm just going to take our keywords and I'll go ahead and drop them in. And with that, that's all you need to do. You can actually set up the rest of your ad groups later on once your campaign is live. The version of Google Ads right now only lets you set up one ad group. I swear they are always changing it, but you'll want to set up at least two more, kind of like what you see in this example. And you'll see which keywords wind up working better. You'll be surprised that manager versus agency versus management, yeah, those are actually different people and you'll find that maybe agency works way better than management. And so that's all there is to it to finding your keywords, but there's one little thing we should talk about before we move on to setting up your ads. Now let's talk keyword match types and how they can save you literally a boatload of wasted ad spend. So when it comes to match types, this is how strict 
or specific we tell Google to be with our keywords. So think of it as a funnel. We have broad at the top, then we have phrase in the middle, and then we have exact at the bottom. And we use quotes around keywords to show that this is a phrase match. And we use brackets to tell Google that it's a exact match. And when it comes to the basics of match types, this is really all you need. Now, once you have your campaign set and your keywords chosen, it's time to write some ads, specifically your headline, since that's going to be the biggest driver of your ad success. Now, as we dive into headlines, let's quickly go over the main components of your ad. And of course, we start at the top with your headline, and this is going to be where you call out specific benefits or roadblock breakers or results, or just simply say what it is that you offer. And this is gonna be the most important part because this is what everybody reads. And then less important, but a opportunity to kind of skirt around the restrictions that Google has is your URL path one and two. And so what I like doing here is leveraging phrases like discount or creating some sort of urgency. Generally, you can sometimes say things in your URL path that wouldn't fly in the headline or description. But of course, I'm in no way, shape or form saying that you should try pushing the envelope. Just saying, sometimes we found that uh, some things seem to slip through. And then finally, we have the description, which we could talk about, but Really, nobody reads it, <laughs> like really. By the time we get to the description, you're just reinforcing whatever was in the headline. And then of course you have your ad assets or extensions. So if you're wondering like, why are we talking about assets? I thought these were extensions. Google just renamed it because they felt like it. So anytime you see ad asset, that's just code for extensions because they've changed the name. And so that's a quick overview of the different components of your ad. And of course your headline is really, really what you want to focus on. And when it comes to writing headlines, you're going to provide Google with anywhere from three to 15, although we'll get to why you shouldn't give them 15 in one go. And as you can see from these examples, it just kind of rotates through different combinations of whatever it is that you give them. And so you're not necessarily going to know what order or how many headlines Google uses, but when you're going through the writing process of headlines, you do want to essentially visualize what you think the ideal headlines would look like. And that makes sure you give Google a good combination of different things to test. Because the last thing we want is to give Google 15 headlines, but five of them are pretty much the same thing said a different way. And so to do that, we'll use some simple formulas. So we'll kick things off with position one. Now we could have top best service location. We could have profession location. We could use squiggly brackets for something called dynamic insertion, get to that in a moment. And then we could talk about our front end offer or we could identify whoever this is for. And then in position two and three, you're going to use some combination of talking about results, breaking roadblocks for them. So handling objections to them clicking or doing business with you. And then finally talking about benefits of your offer. Now, of course, this probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but the good news is there's a very simple exercise you can go through called the reality gap to quickly find all of the roadblocks, results, and benefits, and of course, identify who your ideal customer is. So let's go ahead, jump into that now. So the first thing we wanna do is identify who we're trying to sell to, right? So this could, let's say we have a small business owner. It could be an aspiring artist, runner, swimmer, homesteader, work from home mom, right? So fill in the blank with whoever it is that you're servicing, right? And of course you do also wanna make sure that we're talking about who is actually paying, right? <laughs> so uh, target the person who, at the end of the day, who's whipping out their credit card, right? So if you were, let's say a dentist and you, were, you wanted more um, adolescent or kid clients, we'd write it for the parents, not necessarily for the kids. Probably self-explanatory, but let's go ahead and move on. So let's say we identify how we're going to call out who we specifically help. And then we want to think about what do they want? So let's say the small business owner here, they wanna spend less time in their business. The artist wants to have their own you know, gala or gallery. And then let's say the, the homesteader is looking to be completely off grid, the runner swimmers training for a triathlon, right? And so these are really high surface level, but after 10 or 15 minutes, you're just thinking about what do they actually want? You're gonna have some really good ideas for your headlines. And then we want to take it a step further because once someone knows what they want, 
that little voice in the back of their head is going to start saying all the reasons why they can't get it or why they can't afford it, why they don't have enough experience, time, money, energy, ability, whatever it may be. And of course, you can always pause if you want to um, read through these. But the point here is that you want to think about what do they think is getting in the way of the results that they want. And of course, your product or service hopefully breaks all these down, right? But we have to communicate that. We we have to be able to say, hey, um, I don't know whatever your zoning laws is, if you wanna be a homesteader, but we can help you work around that. Or the artist who thinks they need more artwork to, to have their own showing, or the triathlete who is never, the aspiring triathlete, I should say, who's never ridden a bike before, right? So each every person who's walking through your door as a customer, they have a list of things. And so we want to be able to address that in your headlines. And so another way to think of this, this is a kind of generic list. You want more time, more energy, more freedom, and you think that you probably have experience problems. You don't have enough time. You don't have enough energy. And so if you think of time, energy, experience, you know, limited resources, whatever it may be, you'll be able to come up with a pretty comprehensive list of results that your ideal customers are after and roadblocks they think are getting in their way. So let's say we're a Facebook ads agency. This is would be a really quick, rough overview of results that our customers are after, which is they want their ads to work and bring them more clients and roadblocks that are getting in their way. They think they might have to start over. They don't have enough money. You know, that some something else is getting in the way, like their, their type of business just doesn't work on Facebook, which is probably not the case, but whatever it may be, we just want to have a list like this at the end of the day. And then we can start plugging them into our headline formulas. And so with this simple list, you're gonna be able to start to empathize and call out to your ideal customers in a way your competitors definitely haven't bothered to do because let's face it, most of your competitors, they just went to Google, typed in and looked at the current ads and then wrote their own versions without really giving it a second thought, which is why their ads aren't working and yours will. Now there's one more element that you probably want to consider including in the rotation of your ad headlines and that's gonna be the benefits of your offer, not the feature because nobody cares about features. Everybody cares about benefits. They care about what it does for them and what they get to enjoy at the end of the day, not necessarily the mechanism of how it gets there, right? So if we go back to our dentist example, nobody really cares about the equipment that you have in your dental office, right? If you got the new X, you know, 5,000, that's not gonna mean any mean anything to somebody. But if it results in painless root canal or, you know, quicker recovery from whatever tooth problem there is, I should probably stop talking about teeth. Nobody likes looking at other people's mouths except for dentists and hygienists. Then those things would matter because that machine allows you to make the process less painful or shorten the recovery, right? So let's go ahead, let, let's use a different example. All right, so this is how you could do it. Think about, list out all of the cool things about your product or service, right? So this is gonna be your features. And then we're going to use the magical phrase, so you can, so we can translate our features into the language of our customers, which is benefits, right? And so in this particular example, we have, let's say we're offering someone a, we have a free lead magnet about how to be more successful with Facebook ads, right? So we're gonna use how to, but it could be whatever it is for your product or service. So our offer shows them how to allocate their budget, find the right audience, calculate a return on ad spend and write better ads, right? Okay, so this is all the stuff that it does for them or helps them do. And then we use so you can, so we can translate it into why they care. So you can write better ads so you eliminate wasteful ad spend because they, they want to stop wasting their ads or they want more consistency in their lead flow or they want to be able to scale their campaigns. They want their budget to go further, right? So when someone is trying to be more successful with Facebook ads and we're trying to write a Google ad to get them to click on our ad and download our free offer and do business with us, we don't wanna talk about budgeting and writing better ads. We wanna talk about the end result that they want, which is more customers, right? And uh, less wasted ad spend. And so you can take that list of results 
and roadblocks, who your ideal customer is, and those benefits. It'll probably take you 10 or 15 minutes. You're gonna have way more than you know what to do with. And then you can head over to the Google Ads interface, or you can use the playbook linked up in the description to begin to brainstorm how you would put these together. So again, here's a quick little overview of the different ad formulas and how you can put these together. And even though Google's going to rotate these, you do want to go ahead and write your headlines as if you had all three in a row. And this is really going to help you understand how to take all that information you just created and put it in a format that works within a Google ad. Yes, this process is a little messy, but it's going to be a lot faster than just staring at a blank page, trying to figure out what on earth your ad should look like. So here's an example of some of the ad headline formulas we like to use. And as you use these headline formulas, you always want to write out your headlines before jumping into the ads interface. And so you'll notice with one of these, of course, we're gonna talk about results, roadblocks, benefits of our offer, you know, just be descriptive with our offer, identify who our ideal customer is. But then one of these you'll see has squiggly lines, and this is going to be dynamic keyword insertion. So when it comes to setting up dynamic keyword insertion, we'll go through detailed on how to do that. You essentially just put some squiggly brackets in and Google's going to, detect that, you go through a couple settings, give them a default headline, and you're good to go, right? So that's the super short version anyway. We'll go through that in more detail. For now, here's an example of how this winds up working. So let's say someone is searching for Facebook ads management. And in our campaign, we have the keyword Facebook ads manager. Well, when our ad shows up and they're looking at all the different ads that showed up for Facebook ads management company, our ad headline can say Facebook ads manager. And so is it exactly what they typed in? No, but it's very, very close. And this is also why it's so important to use very tightly related keywords in your ad groups so that you can use techniques like these to really have your ad headline stand out and be very specific to whoever's doing the search. And as cool as it would be, if we could put their exact search phrase into our headline, it probably wouldn't work out too well, especially if they misspelled something. And even Google isn't that creepy. So at least we know they have a line somewhere. So let's go ahead, jump into the next part, which is you can actually add phrases in front or behind the keyword. So here's some examples of phrases you might add in front or behind your keyword. Of course, you could you know, easily spend hours on this, but I recommend just set a timer for like 20, 30 minutes when you're writing your headlines for the first time and you're you're using this technique. And then after that, just say, okay, whatever I have is good enough. It's enough for Google to test because you could really get overly obsessive um, using this. And so here's some examples of what these might look like. And of course, all these phrases are really short because if for whatever reason, your search phrase is too long for the headline, then Google's just going to use the default that's inside those squiggly line brackets. And so let's go ahead, jump into the interface, and I'll show you quickly how to actually set this up. So we're looking at our ads right here, right? So let's say we've gone in, we've already created, done our keywords, we're ready to start working on our ads. And then under the headline, we can just click headline here. We'll click and we'll enter a, the squiggly bracket. And then Google will say, oh, you're trying to do the squiggly bracket. You can also do these inside of descriptions, by the way, but I think that's just way too much work. <laughs> and we'll go and click on keyword insertions. We'll select title case. And then in here, we can go ahead and, and put in our default headline. So if for whatever reason, dynamic insertion doesn't work because there's too many characters or it just doesn't trigger because Google doesn't feel like it, then this is the headline that will show up uh, instead. And once we have that, we can go ahead and click on apply. And then you can also optionally come in here, click this little uh, pin icon, and then you could say only show in position one. And so that way, when their keyword's being inserted, it always shows up in position one. This is one of the few times where you probably want to do this with your first round of ad testing. And that's simply because it will probably make way more sense for their keyword to be in front versus like the last part of their phrase, right? Especially if you're following our keyword formulas in that Google Ads playbook linked up in the description, it's going to be a lot easier and make a heck of a lot more sense to whoever's actually seeing your ads. Now, once you've gone through the process of writing out your headlines, playing with dynamic keywords, word insertion, you should have plenty of content and ideas for the rest of your ad because really, 
Focusing on the headline is the most important part. So we'll quickly go through the other two main elements. So the next part of your ad is going to be your URL path. So this is again, a great opportunity to talk about urgency, maybe make some bold claims or promises. Although I say that with a giant asterisk, you technically are not allowed to make a promise or make any sort of guarantee. So be very careful um, with that. You wanna make sure that you're not saying you're definitely going to be cured of X, Y, Z, right? Like that's a no-no in Google's eyes or you're definitely gonna make money. Definitely can't do that. How many times am I going to say definitely? So I just don't want your account to be banned or you to like misconstrue that, oh yeah, well, Jason said it was okay to try, try that out. I'm gonna push the envelope. Yeah, no, if you feel like you're pushing the envelope, then just don't. So um, that's your headline. I've spent way too much time on that. Headline URL path. <laughs> it's all getting a little tighter. And then we'll go ahead and jump into your description. Now, your description, while it's not going to be read by very, by very many people, is a good opportunity to reinforce whatever's in your headline. Now, you might be thinking, well, how do I do that if I don't know exactly what the headline is? And that's a great question. So when you're going through writing out your headlines, one of the things that I like to do when we're working on client accounts is I'll just take a three headline combo that I really like and I'll write the perfect, what I think is the perfect description for that headline. Google's gonna mix and match, but that's okay. When you're writing things out, make sure that you you stay organized and sane because the algorithm will go do its thing, right? It's, it's gonna try and figure out the best combination. All you can do is give it what you think are good combinations. And of course, inside of your descriptions, you're gonna talk about breaking roadblocks, talk about results, and of course, talk about benefits as well. And so that's all you need to do with the last two components of your ad. And once you have that, you're ready to jump back into the interface and actually publish your ad, or if you have already been running campaigns for a while, maybe you take this and you use it on some of the campaigns you already have, in addition to whatever campaign you're setting up right now. And with our ad copy finally written, realize that was a really long section, but it is, is important. So once we have our ad copy, we can jump back into the interface here. You can see we have our keywords. I'll just go ahead and click on ads. I'll click to create a responsive ad. I'm only going to create one for now, but you'll want at least two. You can have up to three. And of course, Google's going to change the rule as soon as I say that. And to save us some time, of course, I'll just use the playbook and I'll start copying and pasting over. And by this point of the campaign process, it's pretty much just copying and pasting, right? Hopefully you've done most of your copywriting outside of the Google Ads interface. Even if it's just a blank Word doc, your ideas are gonna be so much better than being constrained, especially with that character counter looking at you all the time saying, oh, it's too much, it's too much, it's too much. So we'll go ahead, drop in our URL, and this is going to be where you want the traffic to go. Please don't send people to your homepage. This should be a specific page on your site. Link in the cards in the description to a full-blown landing page guide if you're not quite sure what page to be sending traffic to. So we've got our URL paths, free audit, double your ROAS. Again, big asterisk there. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I'm definitely not telling you to push the envelope. And then of course, we can go ahead and copy over all of our headlines. I'll come down here to description. I'll add a description box, and then we'll just copy and paste in our descriptions here. And of course you have the preview over here. It'll of course rotate through showing you the different combinations of things. And if you see one where you go, ah, that seems really dumb. Just, just leave it, just leave it. Google, Google's gonna figure it out. Google's gonna quickly figure out what, what does it and does not work. And so we'll go ahead and scroll down here. You have the option for business name and logos, which is new as of the time of this recording, site links and call outs and more assets. We can always take care of that later. That's probably the first thing you're gonna to want to do after you've created your campaign. So we'll just go ahead and come down here and click on done. And then I'll click on next. And finally, we have our budget. So this is where I really don't understand why it's the last thing, but this is where we tell Google, how much are we willing to spend per day? So when you're just getting started, it's really hard to know, right? Because let's say I'm bidding $3.86 per keyword. So if I put a budget of $5 per day, well, I'm only gonna get one click a day, right? <laughs> the budget's gonna be spent pretty quickly. But you just have to choose what makes the most sense for you. And sometimes you can, let's say you have a couple hundred bucks for the month. Well, maybe you should just spend a couple hundred bucks the first two weeks, find the keywords that work, 
deposit, wait till next month when you have a new budget, and then you can open up and say five or $10 a day. Now I'm doing this for the United States. And of course, Google's gonna tell me, surprise, surprise, I should give them more money, right? So when you see things like this, that doesn't mean your campaign isn't going to work. It just means Google wants more of your money. Duh. <laughs> so we'll leave it alone. And of course, here's a little breakdown of what your daily budget could look like if on a monthly basis, just for some quick calculations. So five to, you know, 20 bucks uh, per day is all you need, um, almost irrespective of the side of, size of your business to start finding keywords. And of course, you can always spend more later and you can always scale later. It's not like you're missing out on lots of traffic. Google has hundreds of millions of people searching them every month. So if you miss some this month, you'll you'll catch some more next month. So uh, probably not necessary to talk about. So we'll go and click on next. And of course, it's telling me no traffic is expected. Check your targeting settings to fix this. When you see stuff like this, this is Google saying, hey, I noticed you only have phrase and exact match. You should put in some broad match. We we have a lot of traffic for you. Just put in just put in one broad match keyword. Just just one. And you you don't want to listen to them because they are they're just trying to remember, they're a business. They make money when your ads get clicked. They don't care if you actually make money after the ads clicked. Their goal is to get your ads clicked. And um, they also have an inventory problem, which I won't go into. So you can ignore this. We'll come up here to click just publish campaign. Of course, it's telling us we should spend more money and it's telling us they should they should have more leeway with our keywords and we're just going to say no. So we'll go ahead and click on publish here. Your campaign's missing information. If you're doing this for the first time in a new account, this will pop up, it's okay. It just means you haven't entered your billing information yet. So I'll go ahead and click on publish, it'll be publishing. And then if you still need to accept terms of service or set up your billing, then you'll get to a page that looks something like this. So I'll quickly do that, I'll click on fix it. I'll enter our credit card information and then I'll click submit and it'll say pending approval. This could take up to a day sometimes, especially if it's brand new and depending upon the country you're in, just being real. And we'll go ahead and click on fix it. And then it will hopefully refresh. And once you see this, that means you're all set, ready to go. So we can come up here back to our main campaign dashboard and you can see our ads are scheduled, ready to go live. Now. Once you've completed your campaign, whether it's your first one or your first couple, the next thing you're going to want to do is start creating some ad assets. So we'll go through how to actually find where to make these, and then we'll rapid fire through them and then go through in more detail. So first, jumping into the interface here, from wherever you are, you can make sure that you're in your overview. You can click on ads and assets, then we're going to click on assets formerly known as extensions. Again, they're the same thing. And you'll get to a page that looks something like this, where you'll be able to see your assets account wide, almost said extensions. And then of course, click this blue plus button to create more. So timestamps below, of course, to skip around to the asset that you're most interested in. But let's go ahead and rapid fire through some examples here. So the first one and most common type is going to be site links. These are some examples of what they look like. And essentially, this is a great way to filter people and get them directly to the page or information that they're looking for so that they can hopefully make a buying decision. And next we have callouts. And so this is where you can talk about some features or what makes you different. We'll go through more details in a moment. And again, this is just to help people make that buying decision. That's pretty much all of these, uh, all, all of what these assets are designed to do. Then we have snippets, which is just a fancy way of saying a menu of items. We have call, and this is where you can put your phone number in the ad. Of course, don't do this if you're not actually going to pick up the phone or you don't have someone at your business who's going to be able to pick up the phone. Yes, you can set up a schedule for this. Next, we have lead forms, and this is where you can actually get contact information directly off of your ad without someone ever having to go to your landing page or website, and you can actually set up campaigns specifically for this type. Again, we'll go through all of this in much more detail. Then we have locations. So if you have a physical location, you can connect it to your Google business profile or whatever they're calling it because they keep changing that name too. And then for apps, I'm gonna go ahead and skip those. And finally, we have promotions and price where you can essentially showcase whatever your product or services are and actually start giving your potential customers some ideas of what your pricing looks like compared to 
others. Now, what's important to note with all of these different types of assets is we don't actually get to control when they do or do not show up outside of some basic scheduling. So we're not going to be able to tell Google, hey, always show this asset or always show this call out or site link. They're going to make their own decisions based upon how much you're bidding and whatever your goal is for your campaign, because they just want to get you the most clicks possible because that's how they make money. So they're going to rotate through these and use different combinations, but you will be able to see inside of your Google Ads account how these are performing and whether or not they're actually hurting your performance and you should turn them off, although that's pretty rare. Most of the time they actually do wind up helping. And as you can see with all of these examples that we've gone through, it makes your ad bigger. It increases your quote unquote ad real estate, which is just a fancy way of saying your ad's bigger. So hopefully people pay more attention to it. So first up, we have site links. Now, when it comes to site links, the primary goal is to filter people to the information that they need to make a buying decision. So as you can see with this particular example, these pages are all part of the buyer's journey, right? And we'll go through some examples in the moment, but what's most important is that every page that you link to is part of the buying process. So for example, we could link to an about us page where we essentially share a little bit of information about why we believe we're the best fit for whatever your product or service is. And the key is on that page, at the bottom of that page, you have a call to action to book a call with you, to fill out a contact form or something. So you wanna make sure that whatever page you're linking to, any one of these, there's a clear call to action to collect contact information or to have them call you. And of course, contact us, pretty self-explanatory. Someone just enters that information and hopefully it's a lead and not spam, although we, we all get so much, so much spam. And then maybe you want to have some FAQ. So you'll answer some common questions or pre-buyer questions. And then again, at the end, you'll have a clear call to action. And of course, you could also have reviews or testimonials. And of course, any sort of case studies that you have, you want to have a call to action at the end. Now at the bottom here, we have some that you definitely don't want to link to. So don't link to your social profiles, your general blog or a general blog post or company news, right? Because we don't wanna be linking to, first off, you don't wanna be linking to not your website, you're paying for this traffic. And number two, we wanna make sure that everything is a part of the buyer journey. We want to move people along. They just need a little information maybe before they reach out to you or before they purchase your product or service. And so that's what we want to do here. We don't want to link to company news. Also, I've seen other people linking to like job opportunities as well. You definitely don't need to do that in your ads. You might see big corporations do that, but that just means they're wasting ad spend and it's an opportunity for you because you definitely don't need to. So let's jump over to the ads interface and I'll show you how to actually set these up. So from our ads and assets section of our Google ads account, I'll click the blue plus button. I'll click on site link here. And then at the very top, when I click account, you'll see that you'll be able to create site links for your entire account, specific campaigns or specific ad groups. And it's important to note that there's a hierarchy here. So if you create one in a, for an account and one for an ad group, then Google's going to assume that the one you created the ad group level is more important than the account one. It can get a little confusing, but for the most part, you're going to have the same across your entire account. Other ad assets, you're going to only want them for specific campaigns because they're so specific. So I'll go ahead and leave it at account here, and then I'll go ahead and start to drop in our site link information. So to save some time, I've used the Google Ads playbook linked up in the description to write out some examples for a Facebook ads agency, and I'll just go ahead and copy and paste these over. So the first one is going to be a free audit. So this is going to be a lead magnet. And so when someone clicks this link, it'll be a landing page that says, hey, please give us your name and email or just email, and we'll send you this free awesome audit to help you with your Facebook ads. And of course we get contact information out of this, and that's the key with all of these. So the next two are going to be a case study and a contact us. And so contact us is pretty standard. Uh, we use that as an example several times earlier, but you pretty much that's going to be contact us is probably gonna be one of your initial four. You do need to have four, should have said that before. And then finally, we have free Facebook ad tools. And so if you have any sort of free tool or offer that you have on your site, you can go ahead and link that as well. So something to note here with this particular example, the free audit and the free ad tools, they're both 
related to Facebook ads, but they don't necessarily give people more information, but they're just designed to collect contact information. So maybe someone doesn't necessarily want to get on the phone with us, but they just want to learn more about how to actually improve their current Facebook ad performance. So that's what we do in this example. So you can, let's uh, jump over here. So you can see this is what it looks like on mobile. And then if we jump over to desktop, you'll see that we'll have the actual little description here. It may or may not show the examples earlier. Some of the site links were just tiny at the bottom and some of them had this uh, larger ad real estate. It's totally up to Google. We don't know what they're going to decide to do, right? So we also have some advanced options here. This is where you can set a start and end date or a schedule for when these show up certain times a day. This is gonna be really important when you get into things like promotions or discounts or pricing. Um, but for the most part, site links, you're probably just, just gonna have them the entire day. So we'll go ahead and click on save here. And then if you want to see your current site links for your entire account, Again, I'm under ads and assets, assets, and I'm under all campaigns here. And I can just go ahead and click on site link. And as you can see, we'll be able to see all of our site links here. And so that's all there is to it to setting up your site links. Now, when it comes to callouts, there are only three things that we need to do. Highlight features of what we offer, then of course provide any sort of social proof, and then anything we can do to differentiate ourselves from our competitors or just provide some sort of benefits. So I'll skip down to the last example here. You can see they just list off a bunch of awards and it's pretty much just look at how great we are. Then the one in the middle, the second one here, we have them talking about flexible pricing and optimizing, data-driven optimizing, proprietary technology and complex media buying. Now, one of the things that's easy to fall into the trap of when you're creating your callouts is they'll just make no sense or it's a feature that I don't think anyone would actually, your customers might not actually care about, or it's just kind of like a given, like, of course, you're going to use data to optimize my campaigns. What else would you use, right? And so my attitude aside, you do want to make sure that you're making the most of this, this real estate, right? You're making the most of what's in these callouts. So you really want to focus on how can we show that we're unique or different. And so something like flexible pricing here, complex media buying, those are things that could speak to someone who wants, doesn't want to go the typical agency model of being charged or someone who thinks they have a really complex or omni-channel strategy that need, they need developed versus saying data-driven optimizing or proprietary technology. So what? Like you, you need to ask that, self, that question of yourself when you're writing your callouts. So here's some examples of different things that you might want to focus on with your callouts. Of course, we do wanna make sure that when we use industry terms, we they are familiar to our customer, right? We don't wanna come across as using business jargon. And so of course, if you have any awards or certifications, accolades, you can talk about any sort of really quick way to communicate that clients really like working with you. And of course, if you're doing physical products, you can talk about you free shipping or a very generous return policy. So let's go ahead, jump into the ads interface and start building out some callouts. So once you're inside of your Google ads account, of course, you'll just go to ads and assets, assets, click the blue plus button. We'll go ahead and select call out here. Now, as with all ad assets or most ad assets, I should say, it's like one exception there, you can do this in account campaign or ad group level. Now, when it comes to these callouts, I'm gonna go ahead and set them at the ad account level. But when it comes to your different campaigns, you, hopefully you've set them up in a way where each campaign is a different product or service. And so then you'd want to make callouts specific to that product or service, even if there's some overlap. And so to save us some time, I'll use the Google Ads playbook linked up in the description with an example for a Facebook ads agency, which is, I always use that example. And so then we'll go ahead and drop in our callouts here. And you can see that they're showing up in the preview on the right hand side. And so they're only 25 characters. So you're not, do you don't have a ton to do here, but again, we're just listing out some key benefits or features of what we have to offer. If we can show some sort of proof or credibility, that is awesome as well. And then under advanced options, you do have the ability to do start and end dates. But for these, I wouldn't bother with these. These are pretty much always going to be relevant. Um, and if you have any sort of promotion or time sensitive pricing, then you should be using a different ad asset anyway. 
So we'll just come down here to save. And then if you want to see all of your callouts from your account or specific campaigns from your assets section, you can just go ahead and click on callout and then you'll be able to see your list of callouts from there. So I'll jump back over to all. Now, when it comes to structured snippets, the best way to think of them is as a menu or catalog of services. Unlike some of the other ad assets, we're specifically talking about a specific product or service and different aspects of it, or just a general menu of whatever it is that you're offering. And so, as you can see with this example, the moving company has different ways of saying, we move stuff when you need it moved, right? <laughs> so let's go ahead and jump over to these examples here. And so these are just some different ideas of what you could start to kind of brainstorm and think of when it comes to creating your own structured snippets. For example, a travel agency would showcase the different destinations that they book through, or a restaurant could talk about the different menu items that they have or different cuisines that they have, or a e-commerce store could talk about the different shoe brands that they have or watch brands that they have, whatever they are offering. And so you just think of this as a menu, a catalog, or more details on the specifics of the types of products or services services that you offer. So Google does help us out with figuring out what to actually come up with. So let's jump into the interface here. I'll go ahead and click the blue plus button under assets, ads and assets, blue plus, and then we'll go ahead and click on structured snippet. And once we do, we can choose to have this at the account level, campaign or ad group. Now for this particular one, I'm going to go ahead and say campaign because structured snippets are specific to a product or service. And of course we should have a separate campaign for each product or service that we have. So I'll go ahead and select the one that I have here, click on done, we have our demo campaign, and then we can go ahead and select header type. So this is important. This is all the options that we have available to us because this is what's going to show up in the header section. So as an example, I'll go ahead and choose service catalog and you'll see that it says service catalog, right? So we do need to make sure that we choose a option here that makes sense for our business because it's going to say service catalog. So let's say Facebook ads agency here, we'll just go ahead and drop in a bunch of different platforms that we work on. So maybe someone really wants Facebook ads, but they wanna know if, they, if the agency also does Instagram or Pinterest for whatever reason. I shouldn't have said Instagram, duh. I mean, if you do Facebook ads, you better do Instagram ads. So let's say Reddit ads for some reason or, or, or uh, Twitter or something like that. So of course we could go ahead and put in all the different services that we have. Google is going to choose which ones show up, right? So just because we put like 20 here, I don't think you can put 20, I've never tried, but just because you make this really long list doesn't mean every single one's going to show up. Google's going to decide what shows up under the service catalog here. So I'll go ahead and click over to show you what it looks like on desktop. And so you'll see we'll have description one and two, and then you see I have Google partner, ROI, contract free account ownership. Um, those are actually call outs. And then we have the structured snippet. And so sometimes the call outs will show up beforehand. Sometimes they don't. That's why when you're creating these ad assets, always create them as stand alone because you don't know what other assets are going to be combined with them. So with that, we can go ahead and scroll down here. We can go ahead and click on save. And then if we want to see our structured snippets, we just click structured snippet up here and you can see that it's been saved as one group. And so if you want to make different combinations of structured snippets for different campaigns or different ad groups, then you can go ahead and do that and be really detailed if you want. But at the very least, the first time you're doing this, just go ahead, make some general ones for your top two or three campaigns, right? I definitely wouldn't wanna do this at the account level because that's gonna be too broad. And then of course you can always get more detailed from there. Now, when it comes to call assets, they're really easy, self-explanatory. They just have the phone number added to your ad, just like you can see with these examples. And so all we're going to do is jump into the interface and add your phone number. But what we do want to think about before we do that is when do you want people to be calling you? So as an example, we'll say, let's say you have an office, you have maybe a receptionist who can take those phone calls and you're doing them all day. Well, you don't want them to start exactly when you open, right? Because 
they just walked in the door. So maybe start at 9.30 and then you don't want to have calls right when you're trying to close down for the day. So maybe end at 4.30 or 4.15. Now, if you are the person taking the calls and you're like, well, I can't take calls all day. Well, then maybe you just want to do a one or two hour block at lunchtime when people are on their lunch break. Maybe they're looking up something at Google, on at Google, they're looking something up on Google, your ad shows up and then you can say, only show my phone number during lunchtime during the week or only show my phone number in evenings or weekends or whenever you're available to take those phone calls. So that way you're not stressed out having to have your phone next to you all the time and always picking up because you're wasting ad spend if you're not picking up your phone. So that is a really easy way to make sure that you can use these extensions even if you don't have a dedicated person to always pick up the phone. So inside of Google Ads, under Ads and Assets, as usual, we'll go ahead and click the blue plus button here to set up your call, and we'll go ahead and click on call. I should say set up your phone number, but uh, call, anyway. So for our account, unless you're really fancy, you're just gonna have one business phone number. Um, so we'll go ahead and leave it at the account level. We'll go ahead and drop in our phone number here. I'm just using their copy. Please don't call this number, it's, it's completely fake. And you can see over here on the preview where it's going to show up on mobile. And it's nice because someone can just click it. And because they're clicking this number from the ad, Google can easily track and count this as a conversion if you want it to be counted as a conversion. So when it comes to using the call settings, you can just go ahead and leave it at default. Until you get fancy with your conversion tracking, I got a little ahead of myself there, just leave it at account settings, calls from ads, and then advanced options, you definitely wanna make sure that you don't have your call or your phone number there You know, at 1 a.m. in the morning. Unless you have someone to answer, then awesome, great. But unless you do, let's go ahead and make sure that we're not showing it all the time. So let's say we just want Monday through Friday, we'll do 9.30 and then we'll go ahead and do 4 15 p.m. So that way someone has time when they get into the office and then they have time to close down at the end of the day. And we'll go ahead and click on save here. And then of course you can go ahead and click on call over here. And that's where you're going to be able to see all of your different phone numbers or call extensions. And so when it comes to, if you're using any sort of fancy call forwarding system, um, you do wanna double check Google's terms of service um, because they do have some things about, you know, just redirecting calls to a completely different place. Um, but for the most part, if you're on the up and up and you're not trying to scam people, uh, you should be fine, even if you're using a third party service to give you a bunch of virtual numbers. Now, when it comes to lead forms, these are unique compared to all the other types of assets in that they allow people to interact with your ad and give you the information you're looking for without ever hitting your site. And you can actually get pretty fancy with setting up campaigns that only have a lead form and don't direct people to your website, but we'll leave that for another day. So in this example, the first one here, we have a contest. And so the goal of this is, hey, get this awesome free thing or potentially get this awesome free thing if you give us your contact information. So that's an example of just trying to grow your contact or email list. The second one is designed to open up the sales conversation, which is the second goal that you might have for these types of ad assets. So whatever your goal is, you can try both or just stick to the one that makes the most sense for your business, product, or services. But generally, you're either going to be looking to grow your email list or you're going to be looking to start that sales conversation. So here's some examples of what you might want to do, whether it's offering a free consultation, maybe you're offering a free trial, or just trying to get someone on a demo to start that sales conversation, or you're going to offer some sort sort of free report, audit, or webinar to get people to join your email list. And so the sales conversation happens through an email sequence as opposed to trying to collect their contact information right off the bat. Now, when it comes to the lead form, what's cool is Google will auto fill all of those form fields that you ask for. Um, that they that they already have information for. However, you want to minimize the amount you actually ask for. So the minimum I think works is asking for their name and then either their email or their phone number. If you need both, okay, fine, go ahead and ask for both. But if your goal is to grow your email list, then just ask for their email. You're going to get a lot more people opting in. If your goal is to start that sales conversation, then you probably want the phone number more than the email. 
But of course you can always test both, right? So you can create one form that only asks for the email. You can create another form that only asks for the phone number and you could see which one does better over time. So definitely don't feel like you have to get it right on just one form or, or one part. So now let's talk about what you actually want to do with the form with this particular example. So at the top here, you'll have an image. I'll go through an example of what that looks like and the dimensions. You'll have your company name, and then you'll have about 200 characters of text, or I say about, but it, it is 200 characters of text where you tell people why they should opt in, right? So we want to talk about specific benefits of what we're offering. We wanna talk about how it's gonna help them overcome roadblocks, things that are getting in the way, or we could talk about results that they're after. So, and then once they enter their information, the confirmation is going to look something like this. And if you're focused on growing your email list, I know I'm spending a lot of time here if you wanna skip ahead to the uh, timestamps below, if you wanna just skip ahead to the interface, if you're growing your email list, tell them to go check their inbox. Don't send them someplace else unless you have a, another step in the sales process that's ready to go right now. And I'll show you what that, kind of how that works in a moment. But essentially what we want people to do is go open that email because then it's going to help with the internet service provider knowing that you're not a spammer and whoever just joined your email list actually wants to open your email. So that's really important if you're thinking long-term in terms of getting people to open your emails and your emails actually being delivered as opposed to internet service providers looking at your IS, your uh, particular sender address as spam. Because if you get a bunch of people filling out these forms and then they never open the email, you're gonna look like a spammer and then it's not really gonna work out well. So long new way of saying, it's really important to tell people to go check their email. So here is an example. Um, let's say I'm offering a Facebook ads audit. I always go back to this example. So copy this roadmap to eliminate wasteful clicks and launch your own buyer campaigns so you can double your leads with the same budget you have now, get free access when you complete the form below. So if you have extra characters telling people to complete the form below is really powerful. I know it sounds simple, like, well, of course they're gonna complete the form. No, we need to tell them exactly what to do. Complete the form below. And as you can see here, we're telling them what they're going to get. They're gonna get a roadmap and it's going to help them overcome a roadblock that they're struggling with, which is wasteful clicks in their Facebook ads account. And we're going to help them get a result that they want double your leads. Now, of course, we do need to be careful with any sort of claims. 50-50 whether Google lets us say double your leads. So we might have to change that to say increase your leads or potentially get more leads or possibly get more leads, whatever takes up less characters. And then of course, on the same budget you have now is also handling a potential buyer objection. And so if we were doing this to grow our email list, then on the confirmation, we would say confirmed, check your inbox, right? So we want to say, hey, check your inbox. Or if we wanted to get fancy or kind of test the waters a little bit, as you can see with this description saying, hey, it's on your way to your inbox in five minutes, but right now check out this video, right? And this video could be a five or 10 minute, you know, little sales video. But what you don't want to do is give them the offer right there. I know that seems counterintuitive. Google's going to force you to put a link there. So whatever link you put there, you could just have it go to a blank thank you page that says, check your inbox again. But whatever you do, force them to go to their inbox and open the email to get whatever it is that they opted in for. So enough about the copywriting and what we could do. Let's jump into the interface and build this thing. So under ads and assets and assets, we'll go ahead and click the blue plus button. Timestamps below, if I went through that uh, too fast, I realized I started talking a little too fast there. So we'll go ahead and click on lead form and then we'll click the account or campaign. Here, I'm just going to leave it at account. And then if you're doing this for the first time, you're going to have to accept their terms. So if I click on accept terms, you'll of course read through this. And this is essentially saying, hey, you're not gonna turn around and sell their emails or spam their inbox or do something else that uh, spammers do that ruin uh, email marketing for the rest of us. So we'll go ahead and click on accept. And we'll kick things off by entering in our lead form headline. And so this is a headline that Google will potentially use as part of the ad. So you'll notice it's not actually going to show up here. And then we have our business name and then we have the description. Now, just between you and me, the business name seems like a really waste, big waste of real estate. Like I would want to put in, put some sort of call to action there or just say, 
I'd essentially take the headline and put it in business name again. Although I haven't really had the gall to test that because Google gets really mad when you um, try and circumvent things. But if you have that thought and you wanna push the envelope, go for it, but I recommend just sticking with the business name. So I'll get off that little side rant that's probably not helpful and we'll come down to contact information. So I'll go ahead and select name here and then I'll do first and last name separately since we're looking to generate leads. And I know that the email service provider where we would want to integrate with has the first and last name in separate fields. And so this is also important to think about if, you're, if you are going to integrate with a CRM or a email autoresponder, you wanna make sure that the format is actually gonna make sense. So uh, more on that in a little bit though. So we'll come down here, I'll go ahead and click on phone number and email. This is pretty much the maximum amount of information you want to ask for. And you can see here, these are saying pre-filled. So if someone's already logged into Google and they're browsing and Google has that information, they can go ahead and put that in there. Now, something to note with the email is if you're doing B2B, it might actually make more sense to come down here and select work email instead of this other email address because Google's probably gonna pull in their personal one. And of course, it's important that we get their work email address because that's the place that we are more likely to be read versus they're scrolling through their inbox on a lazy Sunday night and they go, oh yeah, this is work related stuff, I'll get to it later. And then you know they're checking the wrong inbox Monday morning when they should be hopefully calling or responding to you. So the other information here, I would go ahead and leave alone until you start getting some data because the more we ask for, the lower our conversion rates are ultimately going to be. And so it's better to have too many unqualified people and go, uh, we should ask for more information to discourage all those tire clickers versus asking 21 questions right off the bat and then wondering why no leads are coming through the lead form. So we'll go ahead and scroll down here. This is an example of all the different types of questions you can ask. And again, I would recommend just starting with their name, first and last name, their email and or phone number, and then going from there. So if you really need this information and you know that you're going to get just way too many leads, then sure, go ahead and add it. But it makes more sense to slowly add barriers over time and kind of refine the traffic you're getting as opposed to try to get the perfect person right off the bat. And then again, wonder why you're only getting one or two leads a week when it's really just because we're asking for too much information up front. So we'll go ahead and jump down here. We can add a background image, but first we're gonna go ahead and insert our privacy policy. So you do have to have a privacy policy just to advertise with Google in general. So you can just go ahead and drop in that URL there. And then we'll come down to add a background image. So when we do, you'll see that we need a image that's 1200 by 628. And so this is actually the same standard that you would use for any sort of discovery performance max or display ads. And so what I'd recommend doing here is just using a basic stock image because it's hard to know how exactly it's going to look on mobile or desktop. If you wanna spend an hour trying to tweak it, make sure your writing is in the exact right place, go for it. But for time purposes here, I'm just going to upload a photo that I got from Canva and I'll go ahead and select that. It's already the right dimensions and I'll go ahead and click on save. And now you can see how it shows up in the lead form on mobile. So we'll go ahead and scroll down to creating the submission message. So this is what's going to show up once someone enters their contact information. So first we'll go ahead and say confirmed, check your inbox because we want them to open that email. And then for our description, we'll just drop in a little text saying, hey, why don't you check out this cool video while you wait for the email to come to you? And then of course, in this video, we would tell them to also go check their inbox or we'd have a call to action to book a call with us. So everything that we're doing here is pushing someone through the sales process and just giving them more information so they're comfortable either jumping on a phone call or ultimately purchasing whatever our product or service is. So for our call to action here, of course, we have a couple of options. I'm just going to go ahead and click on learn more. So someone clicks learn more to go watch the video. Again, I highly discourage having whatever your free offer is right here in this link. Force them to go open their email because that's gonna help with your open rates moving forward with your email marketing. So I'll just go ahead and drop in a random page here and then we'll come down to selecting our call to action for our ad. So this could be a little confusing, 
but this is what's going to show up before everything we just talked about. I don't know why it's at the bottom, but we'll go ahead and say download. And then we'll go ahead and change our call to action description to be Facebook ads audit. So you can see over here, it's going to say download and then Facebook ads audit. I probably should put free or limited offer or something like that. I don't think that would actually work with the character limit, but that's the preview of what it's going to look like. So once someone clicks this, then they'll actually see the lead form. So we'll scroll down again, lead form type. We have more volume or more qualified leads. How Google makes this determination, we will never know. And of course, you can of course go through the terms that you are automatically uh, agreeing to as, as you do this. And this is in addition to the terms you just accepted the first time you were setting this up. Lots of legal jargon, right? Um, but I would recommend leaving this at more volume the first time you go through this process because we would much rather have too many unqualified leads and then refine it down to those, these are really qualified people coming through the door versus trying to get that perfect fit right off the bat because it's really hard to go backwards and try and go up the funnel as opposed to starting with a large breadth of people and then filtering and whittling them down. So that's like the third time I've said that. So let's go ahead and move on to the bottom here, which is export leads from Google. So Google does not offer us a direct way to take the leads that we're collecting and put them into whatever CRM you're using. You're going to have to use Zapier or Zapier or however you say it, because every other person seems to say it differently. I should look up how to actually say it. Maybe ChatGPT could help you with that. But anyway, you're going to have to use that third-party integration to connect this form to whatever email service provider or CRM that you're, you are using. So you can use this search box to see if there is something set up, but um, pretty much any software you're using should have this set up. Although I add a little asterisk that I use the new version of MailerLite and it still doesn't work with this. So maybe you happen to use one of the few softwares that uh, hasn't uh, updated yet, but that's on MailerLite, shame on them. They should definitely have that fixed by now. So anyway, the I'll show you, you can also do something called a webhook, which is super fancy. That is above my head in terms of programming, but it, essentially it's a really fancy way of having the information directly ported over to your CRM. And I would recommend having a developer do that for you if you don't wanna use uh, Zapier Zapier. So we'll go ahead and jump down to import conversions. This is something you'll leave alone for the first round of doing this. You can always get more advanced with your conversion tracking later. And Google's automatically going to track these as conversions and as leads. So we'll go ahead and click on save here. I'll come over here to lead form and you can see CSV, CRM, this is where you can go ahead and, and download your leads. And so if you're not zapping them over to someplace else, make sure you come in here at least every other day. You are paying good money for these leads. So you wanna make sure that you're following up with them in a timely manner, or you have a virtual assistant come in here and download them for you. And with that, you're all set and good to go with your lead forms. Now, when it comes to location assets, as you can see with this example, all it does is add a clickable link to over to Google Maps where someone can actually show up to your physical location. And to actually set this up, it has nothing to do with Google Ads. You need to set up something called a Google Business Profile so that you show up there. Now, you might actually be able to find your business, although there's like a one in 100 chance that actually works. So you want to head over to this site and start the process of setting up your Google My Business Profile or Google Business Profile or whatever they're calling it now because they keep changing the name. And you can tell I get frustrated sometimes when Google changes names of stuff constantly. And what you'll want to do is wait for them to send you a postcard. Yes, Google is going to physically mail you something because they wanna make sure that whatever location you say you're at, you are actually at that location. And so once you get that, you'll be able to enter a special code, you'll get your business profile, and then you can jump back over to Google Ads and set up your location, which is what we'll do now. So inside of Google Ads, of course, we are under ads and assets, assets, and then we'll go ahead and click the blue plus button, and I'll go ahead and select location. And then this dialogue box will pop up. If you already have a Google My Business Profile, it's going to be super easy. If you don't and you want to see if Google already has found your business by some miracle, then you can go ahead and click on Select Curated, oh no, Curated, Curated Locations and click on whatever country your business is in. And then you can go ahead and search for it. 
For the most part though, these seem completely random. And as you can see here, like and other stories or and pizza, cloud smoke and vape co, a zip line tour, one hotel. These are very, very random. So the chances of your business actually being on this list is quite small. If you had someone set it up in the past or you're not sure who has access to your Google business profile, you can actually drop in your domain and try and find that email here and have it sent to you or figure out who you need to talk to to get access to it. Otherwise, you'll want to come back over here to link your account and you can click to manage your business profile here. You'll go over to this same website and page. If you don't already have a Google business profile, this is where you can set one up for free get that postcard. Yes, it's an involved process, but it's definitely worth it because most businesses don't bother to do this. There are a lot of businesses on Google Maps that have actually never claimed their profile. So you can go ahead and get that set up. And then I'll just jump back over here and show you a preview again, that this is what it will look like. And optionally, you can also have your phone number added to it. And this is essentially just gonna make it very easy for people to like search a hotel, local pizza joint or whatever they're looking for. Your ad pops up, they can click on the location. And just like that, they're using whatever navigation they want to, to find you and your physical location. And so if you wanna check out your locations, that you can always click under here. As of the time I'm recording this, it's under legacy. Hopefully by the time you see it, it's on this top list. Google's always changing stuff and your locations will be here. And of course you can go through uh, changing which locations you have, especially if you have multiple ones, you can use something called affiliate locations as well. Now, when it comes to pricing extensions, these work really well for e-commerce and fixed price services. More on that in a moment. So with this particular example, you could see someone can click the more icon and then a drop down of pricing for different categories or different types of offers or products that they have shows up. Now, how much is shown in a Google ad is totally up to Google, right? So we'll give them a bunch of information and then they will decide how much they do or do not want to show, just like every other ad asset. Now, when it comes to services, I'll go through a services example, but you need to make sure that whatever you're offering, if you're using this particular ad asset as a service-based business, that it's a fixed service. So as an example, if someone's coming in for a teeth cleaning or someone needs their dog groomed, those are pretty much, you know what they're going to cost. Or if it's something like a haircut where there are different pricing tiers, but it's not based upon the time. Someone can come in and they know, okay, this level of haircut is 20 bucks. And if you want the shampoo and massage, then it's you know 40 or whatever it winds up being. The point here is, if you're doing this for services, it needs to be something that is actually fixed and not variable. So as a quick example, if you wanna skip this little story, here's the timestamp to do that. When I worked as a mover, our moving company would offer a flat rate for moving, but in the fine print, they would say that it only covers two hours. Now, between you and me, have you ever been able to move out of a place and then move into another one, irrespective, even if they're next door to each other, in less than two hours? Definitely not. So we always had that awkward conversation of, hey, um, it's been two hours and I know half your stuff is strewn all over your lawn, but if you don't agree to pay us more money, we're just going to leave, right? So you don't wanna do that to your customers. Obviously, uh, all of our moving customers happily said yes. Uh, and then we found out that they were unhappy because then they we got a terrible tip. But hey, the company made more money and that's what they were concerned about. Not necessarily our tip or people yelling at us. So I digress. The, the point is you don't wanna put your customers in that situation where you have a certain price in the ad and then the, you, they start working with you or getting through something and then you're like, oh, well actually your yard is way bigger than I thought, right? And I just quoted you a flat price and I forgot to think about the square footage of your yard or driveway for my landscaping services, right? So I probably spent way too much time on that. So let's go ahead and go through some examples of what you might do with your pricing. So obviously if you have any sort of discounts or if you have any sort of doorbuster offers, and so this is where you might have an offer that is significantly cheaper than your competitors. So you can include this in your ad and you can say up to or starting from, or you'd say starting from 14.99 or starting from 54.99. And as long as you have one product, you're good to go there. So for example, a clothing store might have dresses starting at 24.99 and maybe only one dress is 24.99 and the rest are like 50 or 60. Or maybe you have a software company that has various 
pricing plans and you can highlight those in the ad or maybe we're looking at a travel agency providing packages and maybe the bare bones basic four day tour starts at 299 and goes up from there. So essentially what you wanna do is look around whatever you have to offer and choose the cheapest thing and put that in the ad to get people to click. And of course, we've all had that experience on Black Friday, Cyber Monday. You see that big sign says everything's 70% off and then you walk through the door and it's like socks, right? And then everything else is like 15 or 20%. You go, come on, really? Really? Well, we all saw what happened to JCPenney when they tried the everyday low pricing strategy. So it might seem gimmicky, but it definitely works. So start with your low prices to get people in the door. You can always change things if you get too many tire kickers. All right, spent way too much time on that. Let's go ahead, jump into the ads interface and build this out. So under ads and assets as usual for everything we do with um, ad assets, we'll go ahead and click on the plus button. I'll come down to price. And of course we can do this at the account or campaign level. I'm going to go ahead and select a individual campaign here, click on done. And that's because I want these prices to be specific to whatever the campaign is actually about. And then you can go ahead and select type here. Now they have lots of options, but I'm just going to go ahead and select service tiers. And then if you have any qualifiers, as in starting from or up to or average, I like using from because that allows us to put the lowest price possible and make us look really, really good. Even though if it's the bare bones service, sometimes that's just what we need to get people in the door. So I'm going to say from, and then I'll just say Facebook ads optimization from 495. And then we can do units. So it can be a flat rate if it's just a one-time thing. But since this is going to be a service, I'm going to go ahead and say per month. So it's 495 per month. And this is also where you can get clever. I'll show you in a moment. Maybe you want to do it per week or per day or per hour uh, because it allows you to have the perceived cost much lower than what it's ultimately going to be, especially if you have a variable service. Obviously, e-commerce is a lot more straightforward. So we'll go ahead and drop in a quick little description here. It's only 25 characters, not going to be able to do too much with it. And then of course the final URL. So this is important. You want this final URL to be the sales page for whatever the product or service is. Don't send everyone to the homepage, right? We're segmenting people based upon what they specifically want. So I'll go ahead and skip the mobile URL for now and I'll quickly go through these next two. So I'll drop in, let's say Facebook ads writing and it's gonna be 30 per hour. And then we'll have Facebook ad reporting from $10 a week, right? So it winds up being about 40 bucks a month. So, but $10, if we come back up to our example here, I'm going to go over to desktop so you can see. So now we can say $10 a week. So it, it is 40 bucks a month, because uh, or some, some months uh, might have a little more depending upon the weeks. But what we're doing here is we're allowing ourselves the ability to have a lower perceived cost to getting started. So would you want to bill someone $10 a week for that kind of service? Probably not. It's kind of silly and it's probably going to rack up uh, more uh, credit card uh, merchant account fees than you really need to, to deal with. But if it gets someone through the door, it's, it's a really good option because now instead of saying 40 or 50 bucks a month for basic reporting, now someone sees $10 a week. And so it's just a much lower number. I think I've said that enough. So let's go ahead and publish this thing. So I'll go ahead and click on save at the bottom. I can come over here to price and you'll see that price, everything that we just put together is in one block. So this is also important if you have different campaigns that are offering different combinations of offers or pricing tiers, you can of course test them. So maybe you have this one shows things on a monthly or hourly basis, and then the next one shows them on a weekly or flat fee basis, right? So you can also play with what the pricing is and Google will try and figure out which types of pricing that you're presenting works the best in terms of getting you customers. So there's a lot to test here. And of course, just keep in mind that as you create those different pricing tiers or you know different hourly rates or weekly rates, those are all going to be in one asset. So you can create those multiple assets to test out those different way that you're pricing things. I said the same thing twice, didn't I? I said the same thing twice. That's all there is to it to setting up your pricing. Now, when it comes to promotion assets or promotion extensions, the whole point is 
there's a holiday, so we're giving you a discount. That's pretty much exactly what this is designed to do. So choose whatever holiday makes the most sense and then provide some sort of discount. This could be a bundle deal or some sort of percent off, but essentially we're giving them a deal because it's some sort of specific holiday. Now you don't actually have to choose a holiday and it's okay if the holiday has nothing to do with your business. It's pretty much just an excuse saying, hey, it's St. Patrick's Day, so here's 20% off, right? It's just how retail, retail has developed and worked. So when it comes to setting these up, Google actually has a lot of different ones for us to choose from. So let's jump into the ads interface and choose a holiday. So we'll come in here to, of course, ads and assets, ads and assets, probably sick of hearing that by now. So we'll go ahead and click the blue plus button, come down here to promotions, and I'm going to go ahead and do this at the campaign level because I want this to be specific to an offer that's being promoted in this campaign. So I'll we'll go and click on done. So we'll go ahead and click to occasion. You can see here we have all sorts. Of course, you know, pick whichever one is closest and depending upon when, what time of year you're doing this, uh, just make sure you have a basic understanding of what this holiday actually is, right? Because some, some, some of these, it probably wouldn't actually make much sense to do, but I will leave that up to you. To keep things simple, I'll go ahead and click on none here. I'll select monetary discount up to percent discount. And then I'll go ahead and select 70. So what's cool about this, and every retailer does this, but you know, whatever is in terms of your uh, ethics per se, is a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll find one offer, they'll make it the super crazy discount, and then you'll say up to 70% off this particular item or type of item, and then maybe just do a 40 or 50% discount on everything else. And pretty much every Fortune 500 retailer does this. So uh, it's really cool because you can say up to 70% off, even though only one item is actually 70% off. I know when I say it out loud, it sounds terrible. And then you think about every store you've ever shopped at, and that's literally what they do. So you might as well enjoy the uh, consumer psychology for yourself. So we'll go ahead and click on item here. I'll just say men's watch overstock. And then for the final URL, I'll just drop in a random one here. I'm just using men's watch, men's watch overstock as a example. So if you could do sale or discount or overstock, some sort of word in addition to whatever is being offered to show that it, to help explain that it's a discount. So in this particular instance, I'm saying overstock probably isn't. I mean, you go to overstock.com, a lot of that stuff isn't actually overstock. They're just selling it there. And so we just use these phrases to help it reinforce the message that this is a deal and it's a limited time. Of course, do make sure it's a limited time. I think that's probably where the ethical line is for most people. So we'll come down here to promotion details and you can optionally add a pr promo code. So I'm going to add one here so you can see. Personally, I'm not a fan of promo codes because then when someone doesn't remember the promo code or someone hasn't seen it, they go to the website, they're checking out, and then they see that promo code box. And we've all seen it. You go, wait, am I paying more than I should for this product? Is there a promotion someplace that I, I didn't know about? So I don't want our clients, customers thinking that. So I tend to leave this alone, but I'll leave it here just so you can see what it looks like in the preview. And so then we'll come down here and we can display a promotion date. I highly recommend display a promotion date to add some real urgency to this offer. So in this particular instance, I'm just going to say it runs for a month. So now you can see it's valid from June 1st to June 30th. And then finally, we have to set up our scheduling. So this is a little weird where let's say we were doing um, Mother's Day or something like that. I actually don't remember if that was on there. St. Patrick's Day, I know that was there, right? So let's say we're doing a St. Patrick's Day uh, special. Well, Google isn't going to automatically make your ad run only during St. Patrick's Day week or weekend. So we do have to set these dates and make sure that we're not saying, hey, 70% 70 off for St. Patty's Day and it's like December, right? <laughs> so we'll go ahead and add our start and end dates the same as the valid date. That way we don't have invalid promotions running. And hours of the day, I would go ahead and leave those alone. So I'll go down here, click on save, and then we can come over here to promotions to see our list. You probably wanna check in on this at least once or twice a month, just to see how the promotions went. Make sure the ones that were ending, actually ended on time, you didn't fat finger accidentally make it a month more than it should be. And then of course, over time, you'll see which holidays and what types of promotions begin to work the best for your business product and service.
Now, if you're still watching, go ahead and hit that like button. This has been a long one. Yes, I did have to take a break in between recording. And now that we have your campaign set up, your ad assets are hopefully set up. If not, you have some good ideas. It's time to actually go back and use the keyword planner to go ahead and do some keyword research to find more keywords. So in the cards in the description, link to that Google ads playbook that has some simple formulas you can start with for your keywords. And then we're going to take those keyword formulas, use them as seeds, as you'll see in a moment, and actually go through the keyword process that most people go through. But the advantage you have is you're already in the game. You already have a campaign set ready to go with keywords. We are just looking for more opportunities versus trying to do this from scratch. Now to kick things off with the Google Ads Keyword Planner, of course we go back into your Google Ads account, right? So I'm in our, our demo account here and I'm going to come up here to Tools and Settings and I'm going to click on Keyword Planner. Now you have a couple of different tools up here and you can actually see Google is, Google <laughs> Google's, has this cool little tool to help us actually organize our keywords, but I'll also go through how to just use ChatGPT to have it organized as well. So we'll go ahead and click on discover new keywords and you have two options here. You can start with your website. So if your website has a lot of content on it, then you could go ahead and try this or we could go ahead and just start with keywords. Now the good news is that playbook linked up in the description, you can use the seed keyword formulas that are in that playbook as your seed keyword. That was not the right way to say that. You can use those keywords as seeds for your keyword research. So as you can see here, these are really simple and basic keywords. Uh, this is honestly what you can use for your first campaigns, hopefully you have. And now you can take these keywords, come to the keyword research planner and do a more in-depth dive into finding out some other keyword opportunities that you may have missed. And of course, I'll go ahead and start off with a couple of broad keywords. Let's say I want to promote Facebook ads even though our agency doesn't really do much of that. So we'll go ahead and click on get results here. And first we'll go ahead and walk through the setup. I'm gonna go ahead and X this out. And then we'll go step-by-step step into finding the ideas. So up top here, if you want to change your search, which I don't recommend doing once you have three or four keywords in here, you don't need more than five. We wanna be really broad. You can always come in here and change which keywords you're using as your seeds, or you can go ahead and switch to a website. I'll go ahead and exit out of that. You, of course, we have the options of changing which country we're looking at the keywords for. And this is mostly important when it comes to traffic data. So I'm gonna click cancel. And of course, we wanna make sure we're using the right language. Although Google's probably figured out which language you want based upon the keywords you typed in. And then of course, we do want to make sure that we're only looking at Google results. We don't want Google and search partners, which is a rant for another day. And then of course we have our date ranges and I'm just going to say all available because I just wanna know what the average monthly searches are. And then of course here, it allows you to broaden your search, but you don't want to do that because there is such thing as being too broad. So if we are looking to find clients who want us to manage and optimize their Facebook ads, well saying advertising, internet marketing, or something like even Facebook pixel, that's way too broad. I mean, that has nothing really to do with someone looking for management. So it is possible to be too broad with your keywords here. So for the most part, broadening your shirts, search, search, search isn't what something you'll need to do. But you can come down here to filter and you can exclude keywords in my account or in my plan. So if you've been testing before, you can go ahead and make sure you say exclude keywords in my account. That way you're not double counting keywords. And so that does it for the basics of setting up your keyword list before you start coming up with ideas. And the next thing we're going to want to do is come over here to refine keywords and start unchecking boxes that are irrelevant to what we are offering. And so here, I'm just going to, well, we probably wanna leave Shopify, but things we know are searches that have nothing to do with getting people who are looking for Facebook ads management. We'll go ahead and remove all of these branded terms. So I'll leave Facebook business and M Facebook and Shopify and FBS because I'm not quite sure what those keywords will look like, but something like Google or Reddit, if we were running ads for people, we would do that in a completely separate campaign. So I'll just quickly come down here to service uh, we definitely don't want to be giving accounting 
And then for these, I'll go ahead and leave them alone. Maybe I'll come back in and remove management tools. So I can go ahead and exit out of there. And now we can come in here and start to look at keywords that represent buyers. So you'll notice here that this is a new account. And because it's a new account, it's going to show a range. It's not going to show you an exact number. So when you spend some money with Google, they'll start giving you exact monthly ranges. But really for the most part, these are estimates and your campaign settings are gonna change these so much, it's not really that important. And besides, if a keyword represents your buyer and there's only 100 searches per month, who cares? That's 100 potential buyers, right? So what you want to do now is of course say show rows. We're gonna say 500 because we wanna see way more than um, what they're currently showing us. And all we want to do is select keywords that represent someone looking for our product or service. And so as I scroll down here, you'll see Facebook Business Manager Account or Facebook Campaign Manager. This might represent, this might represent someone who's looking for someone to manage, but it also might represent someone who's just looking for software. And so we'd have to look up that keyword and see what are the search results and what are the ads that are showing up for it. And then of course, something like Facebook manager billing, not a person looking to purchase services. And so to save us some time, I'll go ahead and quickly run through this list and grab all the keywords I think are related to people who are actively searching for someone to manage their ads versus just looking up some information or for software. Phew, okay, so 10 minutes later, went through uh, the first 500 keywords here and went ahead and just selected every keyword that I thought would be relevant to someone who's actually searching for a service. And of course, since Facebook's ad manager is called Facebook ad manager or business manager, there is a lot of keywords that has manager or management in it, but it's someone who's looking for the software or how to use Facebook, not necessarily looking for someone to help them actually manage it. So ideally, I would keep going. I would go another page and go through all 824 keywords we have here. But for time purposes, and because this is a demo, I'll just stop here. But you definitely wanna scrape the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and add keywords to create a plan. And so it will be adding them to our plan. And then if you were doing this for real, then you'd go ahead and go to the next 300 some odd keywords and you'd go through the list again. And again, here you're just looking, is this someone looking to purchase a product or service that I offer, right? That's all the criteria we need for coming up with these keyword ideas. So now we can hop over to our keyword plan here and we can go ahead and give our plan a name. You can save it so you can work on uh, multiple kind of groupings of different service keywords or product keywords that you're working on. And we'll go ahead and dismiss. Yes, all of them have been added to our plan. Now, obviously we can't just take these keywords and throw them into whatever campaigns we have running already, right? We need to take this and actually start to organize them. Now in the past, I would talk about, hey, let's go ahead and download this into a CSV. And then we're going to manually try and group keywords together. But Google has this cool new tool to help us take our plan and organize it into something that would actually resemble different ad groups. Because at the end of the day, we want to take these and have them in three to seven tightly, cor tightly correlated or related groupings of keywords so we can make really targeted ads for each one of those groups. And so now that we have this list of 40 keywords, we can try to use the organized keywords and keyword saying, keyword being try. And of course I take a five minute break and it says it's been two hours. <laughs> Got all of Google and some of their timing. So once we go ahead and click organize keywords, you'll need to set up a new campaign if you haven't already, because Google wants you to have a campaign in order to create this plan. Don't worry, it's not actually going to be put into your account immediately. In fact, it's actually hard to get data from here into your account for some reason. Or your page will look something like this because we already have a campaign set up. So I'll go ahead and click to select a campaign that I specifically want to add these keywords to. I'll select our demo campaign here, select maximize clicks because that's what Google wants. And then we can just continue to go through the process in order to get our keyword plan. Now, here's the issue that uh, we keep running into. And that is that this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And so what they want you to do is download the plan and you can download the CSV, but as you can see here, they've still left the majority of the keywords 
over here on the right hand side. So they haven't actually organized much of anything for us. And so I'm sure that this tool will be way better by the time you're looking at this. So what I recommend instead of using Google's tool is number one, you can come back to your saved keywords. You can download them as a CSV or to Google Sheets. I'll go ahead and download them to Google Sheets and just save to my drive and open it up. And then we have all of the keywords ready to be organized. So in the past, you'd have to manually organize these. It would take quite a bit of time. And when we're setting up new client accounts, this is one of the most time consuming parts of the process. But now we have the power of AI, so we can go ahead and try that. So I'll go ahead and take all these. I will copy them and I'll jump over to Jasper, which uh, I think runs on chat GPT, uh, but whatever AI you like to use, I'll leave a link to Jasper in the description. It's my current favorite. And I'll ask AI to put together some ad groups for us. So I'll go ahead and tell the AI that I want them in groups of three to seven based on similarities. Each group, group should be unique, not repeat keywords, and let it know that this is going to be used for Google ads. Now. Jasper also has this enhanced prompt, so it can go ahead and take the information we have here and add it into it. And so I'll just go ahead and let AI uh, run its course. And then I'll go ahead and drop in the keywords. It will do its thing. And hopefully we'll get some keywords. I am doing this live with you right now. And so now we can come back up here and we can see that it's gone ahead and grouped the keywords together. Unfortunately, it has done more than seven per uh, grouping of keywords here. So all you have to do when the AI does this, because it does that sometime, Facebook ads agency, we can just go ahead and take the keywords that are too many. Oops, take the keywords that are too many. And apologies for the bad cut, just didn't wanna waste time have you watching me type. So what I did is I copied these keywords here and I pasted them in down here and I told the AI to please go ahead and split them into another group. So we'll go ahead and wait for it to do its thing. And hopefully it brings it down this time. So now we have two good ad groups and we'd need to keep going. And this is part of using these AI tools. So we'd come in here again and say, hey, let's cut this, let's cut this one in two. But as you can see, you don't have to spend an hour or two going through trying to take this long list of keywords and break them into similar groupings. Now with the power of AI, we can just go ahead and say, hey, chat GPT, hey, Jasper, whatever <laughs> you're using, they all kind of use the same backend thing anyway. Uh, I think Google Bard's still a bit behind, but that's another video for another day. As you can see, it's really easy to use these tools to quickly organize your keywords. And now you can go ahead and start searching on Google to see what other ads show up to make sure that these are in fact buyer keywords. And then of course, the next step will be actually uh, writing your ads and uploading them to your campaigns. And if you're interested to see how much it's going to cost, then we could go ahead and come over here to forecast, say all, all saved keywords. And then you can start playing with your bid strategy. Like let's say we're going to do manual CPC. We'll click apply. Uh, match type will be phrase apply. And now we can start to see based upon the keywords that we have, how much do does Google think it's going to cost? Now these of course are estimates, right? I'll actually change this back to maximize clicks, click apply. And now it will tell us Average CPC, it's probably gonna cost us 225 a click. And so if we're spending uh, 300 bucks or pretty much 400 bucks a month, we could expect to get 173 clicks. And then of course, down here, it gives you an even more detailed breakdown by keyword. I don't recommend going through this too much or obsessing it over it too much because after a week or two of testing out these keywords, you're gonna have much better data because it's gonna be real world and Google will actually tell you how much you need to be bidding in order to show up on page one or show up on the top of page one if you really think that's a good keyword. But you can, of course, go ahead and play with this tool to kind of see how your numbers might change and, of course, gives you a much better understanding of what your budget might be. So now that you've hopefully created your campaign, run, run it for a little bit of time, or maybe you have some old campaigns that you want to come back to. And of course, hopefully you have your site assets set up. You've gone through the keyword research. You're finally ready to go. Your campaign's been running or 
you're just wondering what do you do once the campaign runs, the first thing you're going to want to do inside the Google Ads interface is set up your columns. So I'll go ahead and jump into our demo account here and I'll go ahead and click to modify columns. Now I'll jump over to a client account so you can see the columns that I like to use. This is specifically for search campaigns, but it's just minor modifications for other types. So I like having clicks, costs, impressions, CTR, and average CPC. So clicks is just how many clicks did it get? Cost is how much did it cost you over whatever period you're looking at? And then impressions is how many times the ad showed up. Average cost per click, this is how much on average did you wind up paying? Irrespective of your bid type, at the end of the day, you, you kind of pay per click. So uh, even if you're doing some advanced things like custom conversion actions or cost per action or maximize conversions, CPC is still going to be helpful. And then of course, CTR, that's the click-through rate of your ads. And so scrolling down here, I also recommend adding conversions. If you don't have conversion tracking set up, you probably don't if you're getting started for the first time, then that's the next thing you wanna do after watching this guide. So link in the cards in the description to how to use Tag Manager, how to set that all that up. Although now you have to put the tag directly on your site. So I shouldn't say Tag Manager. So confusing. So now we'll go ahead and scroll down. For the most part, I don't use any of uh, most of these other ones, but I do like to know the optimization score. This tells me, just tells us what does Google think about our campaign in terms of how optimized it is? Although don't fall into the trap of optimizing for your score. You always wanna optimize for conversions because the score and your conversions, not always the same thing. And then of course, I'll go ahead and select bid strategy. You only need to click that if you're doing some more advanced automated bidding strategies. Competitive metrics, this can be really helpful because you can start to see where you're missing out on uh, certain aspects. And you can do this at the campaign and the ad group level. So what I like to do is have search lost as budget and search lost as rank. And so this tells me how many times did our ads not show up because we ran out of money? And then how many times did our ads not show up because Google thinks our ads stink? <laughs> so that's what those two. And then search impression share just kind of lets you know, uh, it's a general number of all the times you could have sh showed up, what percentage are you? And the higher this number, the more optimized you are and the closer you are to maximizing your market. And then if you're doing phone calls, you can go ahead and add phone calls. So I realize that can be a little confusing, but those are the columns I like to add when doing the analysis. And speaking of analysis, there's going to be an issue that you're gonna run into when you start looking at your campaigns. So this is a example of a campaign that we ran in the past. And you'll notice here that one ad group got 40,000 impressions and the other got 3,000. <laughs> How do you compare that? You really can't. And so some of the times when you go in, this is very normal. What you're going to have to do is number one, either say, okay, well, I don't care. This one's working well enough and just turn off the one that didn't get enough impressions. Or you need to go make a separate campaign just for this ad group so that you can tell Google, spend $5 here or 10 and spend five or $10 here and force Google to spend that money on that ad group so you can learn about whatever targeting or keyword ad sets you have inside that ad group. And so that's something that you're going to find a lot with Google ads because you set your budgets at the campaign level. And so Google is going to just spread their budget however they see fit or spread your budget however they see fit across your different ad groups. And so it's really common to come in here and go, why did you spend all my money, 140 bucks on just one ad group? I have all these other ones. Why, why won't you spend it? And the answer is, don't know, so you have to create a new campaign. So with that, let's go ahead and jump over to another account. And this is gonna be where you want to look at keywords. And so to look at keywords, just click the ad group you want to analyze and then go ahead and click on search keywords. So I'll go ahead and make this all big here. And of course, just blurring out some sensitive client information. But what you want to look at is your clicks, impressions, and CTR. And so what you're looking at here is saying, okay, which keywords are getting us traffic? You need to have at least a thousand impressions for you to evaluate a keyword. So in this particular ad group, we can only evaluate these first three because the rest don't have a thousand impressions yet. So we just need to wait until they have some impressions. And once they do, we can look at their click-through rate and we can see these are all above 10% with the exception of this one, VET. And so number one, we could say, well, for whatever reason, that keyword doesn't seem to work for us and you could turn it off. 
Or if you have conversion tracking set up, you can start looking at the number of conversions you're getting per keyword. Although for most accounts, unless you're spending thousands a month, your conversions are gonna be so small, it's gonna be really hard to actually make decisions on conversions. So we'll keep talking about click-through. Now, the other thing you can do is look at costs. And this is where, this is analysis, right? It's not black and white because we're looking at, oh, well, the click-through rate's bad, but it doesn't cost as, as, many, as much money to get people. But then you can see over here on the conversion rate, it actually winds up being lower than these some of these other ones. And so in this particular instance, I would have turned off VET and I would have turned off affordable VET because the conversion rates are so low and we've reached statistical significance with the conversion rates. If you don't have conversion rates, then just look at your click-through rate. It's not the best and most ad managers would just look at me in shock like, what are you doing? Why would you make those decisions based on click-through rate? But And so if you don't have conversion data, you can always just base your decisions based upon click-through rate until you get statistically significant with conversions. Now let's go ahead and jump over to a search terms report. So inside of your ad group, you can go ahead and come down here to search terms and I'll just go ahead and make this nice and big. And as you'll see here, these are all the actual search phrases or close variants of them that our ad showed up for when someone went to type into Google. And so what you want to go through this list and do is essentially say, are any of these things we should not be showing up for? Uh, that's pretty much what you want to do. And so this is how you start to refine the keywords and the search phrases that you show up for. Now, is this gonna show every single search phrase? No. Is this going to show the exact search phrases every single time? No. And of course, when you go ahead and look at impressions here, and you'll see even though this campaign has spent $13,000, we can look at the impressions and see that very quickly, you'll get into search terms that have only showed up 26 times. So you probably only need to look at this once a month, depending upon your budget. And again, we're just looking in here saying, hey, do we want to be showing up for these keywords? So as another example, here's another account you can see here. We have some keywords highlighted like adoption and that we definitely don't wanna be showing up for. So we'd go ahead and add adoption as a negative keyword to our ad group so that we don't show up for those types of keywords. And to do that, we'll go ahead and collapse. You can click on negative keywords and then you'll be able to add those negative keywords at the ad group level. I like adding them at the ad group level uh, just because that makes sure that you don't mess up, uh, you don't have conflicts with other campaigns because sometimes it's hard to remember what keyword was where. Now for the fun part, ad optimization. Very similar to keyword optimization, we're going to be looking at our click-through rates and conversion data if we have them. And so for this particular example, I won't be using a search campaign, I'll be using a discovery campaign just because that's all I have in this particular account that has enough data to do much of anything with. So the first thing we want to do, just like with our keywords, is make sure that they have at least 1,000 impressions. So I'll be looking at these ads. And then I'm going to either look at conversion data, which I don't have for this particular campaign. So instead, I'll be looking at click-through rate. Well, looking at the click-through rate here, I can see that the first two are above 2%. This one's only at 1.252, and then this one's at 2.4. Well, this tells me this one is definitely performing the best out of all of them, and it's only costing me 11 cents per click. So something th with this particular ad combination is working really, really well. Now, in this particular instance, you'll see that they're all in the same ad group, which is important. So you want to be evaluating this on an ad group level. And then also that just makes sure that everyone, every single ad is targeting the same audience. So you need the same audience. So you're having apples to apples comparison. And since these three are targeting in the same ad group, I can compare them. And even though this is only at 12,000 and this one has over a thousand more, I could go ahead and turn these two off and just let this one run because this one's obviously doing better and it's way costing us significantly less than this one for sure we'd turn off. And then we go into the creative and we figure out, okay, why is this one working while the other ones aren't? Now, even with search ads, you're gonna have multiple different headlines floating around and responsive display and discovery are going to do the same. So it is difficult to figure out what specifically in this combination of headlines or this combination of images is causing it to be really cheap or provide really good click-through rates versus some of the other ones. And that's going to be where 
you're you're sometimes you just wind up guessing, right? It can kind of feel like a guess. Well, I think it's this image or I think it's this headline. And so you create a new ad and you let Google test it, right? And we could come back and find that the new ad we made does way worse. And we're like, okay, well, at least we left the one that was winning on. And that's kind of how you continue to optimize and test your ads. And of everything that you do, once you find your audience and keywords, ad testing is going to be the majority of how your time is spent. Because once you find your audience and your cu- or your customer base, then it's just a matter of figuring out how do we best communicate to them and best call out to them so they understand that we can provide a better solution or the best solution compared to all of our other competitors. Now, depending upon your type of business, this next one may or may not be all that important. And that's going to be location optimization. So if you are a brick and mortar or you're servicing a specific geographical area, this is really important. If you're doing just general online services or e-commerce, probably not gonna matter as much. But anyway, let's go ahead and jump into another campaign example. So once you're inside your campaign, you can come down here to the locations, click on location, and then you can go ahead and start to see data based upon your location targeting. Now, if you come in here and you just have one country or one state, then the first thing you wanna do is <laughs> change that so you have the individual states, territories, zip codes, um, and even if you're using radius targeting, you want to make sure that you're always including zip codes or neighborhoods on top of radius targeting so you have a list of things to look at here. Now, as you can see with this one, even though we had 44,000 impressions, there's not really a lot enough data for us to know. I mean, we're spreading it across 50 states. So in this instance, I would probably just leave things alone. But if you wanted to, you could come over here to bid, like let's say for whatever reason we know New Yorkers hate our stuff. Well, we could either, number one, we could add this as a, we could take it out of targeting and exclude it. So that would be something where we come up here to edit and add New York as an excluded territory. Or we could just say, well, we just don't wanna pay as much. We'll do minus 90%, or not increase, decrease 90%. And let's say Texans really like our stuff, right? So for some reason, people in Texas really like our stuff. So we'll go ahead and do that. So Texas plus 90, New York minus uh, 90. And then let's say Californians are pretty neutral on us. So we'll just say increase by 20. And then Florida will say, we'll decrease by 20, right? So I'm just kind of making things up here. You can get really OCD. And for the most part, it really doesn't matter. It's going to be months for until your campaign has enough data for this kind of stuff to matter. But it's here, and of course, you also can click edit, and that will allow you to start excluding locations if you find that, that what, for whatever reason, that type of location targeting is really performing poorly. Now, our second to last optimization is going to be devices. So I'll jump over to a, another campaign here, jumping all over the place with these examples. And as you can see here, we have computers, mobile, tablet, and TV, TV screens. And so what you can do is you can make bid adjustments if you don't want to show up on a particular device. So in this particular instance, we took off mobile phones and tablets because in a previous test, we figured out People are on mobile, they keep clicking, the clicks are super cheap, but then they don't join our email list. They don't get the cool free thing that we're trying to offer them. So even though it was more expensive, we wound up having everyone go to a desktop for this particular one. Although you can see the CTR was really, really bad. So this is an example of a campaign that was a total flop. <laughs> but irrespective of that, you're gonna, you're gonna have uh, quite a few misses as part of, the, part of the ad game. You can actually come in here and decide, hey, you know what? Why don't we in campaign, in one campaign, we're gonna take away desktop, right? And then in the other campaign, we're going to take away mobile. So you essentially have two campaigns that are almost identical to each other. The only difference is the devices that they are targeting. And so you'll sometimes find that maybe you need a different message or a different style landing page. And that's why mobile traffic wasn't working, right? Maybe even though you have a responsive site, something wasn't you know quite working well on the smaller screen size. So we just needed to make a different page. And now just like that, things are working well. So the final one is going to be your ad schedule. So here's an account from one of our clients where they only want their ads essentially running while their office is open. And so what you can do here is once you've set these up, and if you don't have them in your account, you can just hit this uh, 
little schedule icon or the pencil to edit, and you can create different blocks throughout the day. And so then you can come in here and you can start to analyze which times of day and which days of the week wind up performing the best. For nine out of 10 business owners, you're probably never going to make it to this point. It probably doesn't matter because you need to get so much traffic in order to reach statistical significance with these different uh, time blocks, right? And so that's the last optimization that you'll be looking at. But out of everything that we've talked about, starting off looking at your keywords or your audience targeting, that is priority number one. Which one of who, who you're targeting, finding where your ideal customer is, making sure you go through that search terms report to add those negative keywords, and then it becomes all about your ad copy and creative. How do we increase our conversions and click-through rates by optimizing our ads? And then when it comes to your locations and devices and scheduling, that's something you'll probably do in month three or four once you have enough data to actually make some good decisions because you've reached statistical significance with enough. And that's at least a thousand impressions. Ideally, you'd want a hundred clicks, but as long as you have a thousand impressions, you can start making decisions. And with those optimizations down, you are now ready to go mastering Google ads. Wow, thank you so much for sticking with me through this long video. You could probably tell the sunlight changed throughout the day because this took forever to record. And spoiler alert, I, I did have to, to take a day break in between them because my voice died. But if you got value out of this and you're actually one of the very few people still watching, please hit that like button. Let me know below, comment below with any of your questions. We genuinely wanted to make sure that this was as comprehensive as possible where you could go from A to Z and everything in between to get your ads account set up and running with Google Ads. That was a weird way to say it, but I'm tired, so we're just gonna keep going. So make sure you check out that link in the cards in the description one more time to the Google Ads playbook that walks you through all of this process and is just gonna help you stay organized, make sure that you know what keywords to use, your seed keywords, help you go through your ad copywriting, and of course, optimizing, which is going to be your next big step. Now that you've actually created your ad assets, gone through the keyword research, actually created a campaign. So hit that like button, subscribe for more crazy deep dive guides just like this one, but mostly ones that are a whole lot shorter. And until the next, keep building the business you love.